Section zero of the Diamond Sutra Chin Kang Ching or Parajna Paramita by Unknown read by John Greenman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diamond Sutra by Unknown translated from the Chinese with an introduction and notes by William Gemmell. Preface and Introduction Preface This English version of the Diamond Sutra, translated from the Chinese text of Kumara Jiva, owes its inception to successive conversations with a friend, profoundly interested in the interpretation of Oriental systems of philosophy. During those conversations renderings into English were made of numerous passages from the works of Confucius, Mencius, and Lao Tzu. Having surveyed briefly those fertile fields of thought, we passed, by a natural transition, into the delectable Buddhist realm. Some passages from the Chinese sutras, comprising texts and annotations, were consecutively examined and variously considered. Eventually it was suggested that the Diamond Sutra, perhaps one of the most metaphysical of the works ascribed to Buddha, be conveniently rendered into the English language in order that the rather unfamiliar text might assume due intelligibility parallel passages and numerous annotations were subjoined as the pleasant work of translating proceeded the idea of printing and publishing the text seemed to follow as a natural sequence already there exist in the english language renderings of the diamond sutra from the sanskrit by max muller and from the chinese by Beal. This new version does not seek to enter into rivalry with those erudite works, and a possible apology which might readily be offered for the publication of this modest volume is that the scholarly production of Mueller and Beale, in their present forms, are perhaps slightly inaccessible to the general English reader. It would appear that the peculiar charm of the Buddhist philosophy, and the remarkable purity of the Buddhist faith, are becoming more generally appreciated in Europe. Should this imperfect rendering of the Diamond Sutra, even in the faintest degree, confirm this just sense of appreciation, or prove a gentle incentive to further inquiry, then its unexpected publication may prove to be not entirely unjustified. In recording our many obligations to those scholars whose works were frequently consulted, we also give expression to a hope that nothing of importance is omitted which ought to be gratefully acknowledged. It may also be permissible to express admiration of the piety and appreciation of the friendship of those learned monks in central China to whom we are everlastingly indebted for even a slight initiation into those inexhaustible truths which are alike the heritage and the glory of the disciples of buddha amongst those we should like to specify are chang ming the chief monk sun kwan of chen chao prefecture hunan and the aged and affectionate chiu xian w m gemmel pollock shields glasgow six september nineteen twelve introduction the Diamond Sutra is one of the most valued and widely read philosophical works in Buddhist literature. It is very popular amongst ardent Buddhists in China, and excepting the Lotus of the Good Law and the Leng Yen Ching, perhaps no other sutra ascribed to Buddha is regarded by the Chinese with so great esteem. In Japan, the Diamond Sutra appears to be perused extensively by what Max Muller termed the Shingon sect, founded by Kobo, a disciple of the renowned pilgrim Huin Sang, about the year 816 A.D. The Diamond Sutra was written originally in Sanskrit, and in process of time translated into the Tibetan, Chinese, Mongol, and Manchu languages. It represents the Mahayana school of Buddhist thought, a school founded by Nagarjuna, which flourished primarily at Chakuka, and thereafter influenced appreciably a considerable part of the Buddhist church. 
In the year 1836, Tsomo Korosi published an account of the Tibetan translation, which interesting document may be consulted in Volume 20 of the Asiatic Researches. The Diamond Sutra is therein designated the Sutra of Wonderful Effects, a treatise by means of which Sakyamuni Buddha instructs Subhuti, one of his conspicuous disciples, in the Prajna Paramita of Transcendent Wisdom. To Kumarajiva, a native of Kashmir, who gained distinction as a monk of the later Qin dynasty, A.D. 384 to 417, is conceded the honor of having first translated the Diamond Sutra into the Chinese language. Of subsequent Chinese translations, perhaps the most noteworthy, is the text ascribed to the scholarly Hiren Sang and completed about the middle of the 7th century. A rendering into English of Kuramajiva's Chinese translation was accomplished by the Rev. S. Beale and published in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, 1864-65. The text and German translation of the Tibetan version were published in 1873 by M. Schmidt in the Mémoire de l'Académie saint pierre The Mongolian translation was presented by the Baron de Constad to the library of the Institut de France. The Manchu translation is in the possession of M. de Herlet, who, with the aid of the Tibetan, Manchu, and Chinese versions, published a French translation of the Sanskrit text of the Diamond Sutra in the Journal Asiatique, 1892. It has been observed that, quote, at first sight it may seem as if this metaphysical treatise hardly deserved the worldwide reputation which it has attained, unquote. Regarding this descriptive worldwide reputation, devout Buddhists might suggest in extenuation that throughout many centuries the spiritual wisdom of the Diamond Sutra produced in countless minds a conscious blessedness of perfect peace. This spiritual wisdom also appeared to be a strong incentive to holiness and a gradual inspiration to those who had entered the path which leads to nirvana. In a few renowned monasteries of central China, our Buddhist friends frequently affirm that by contemplating the spiritual wisdom of the Diamond Sutra, the mind would inevitably become transfused with the mellow light of imperishable truth. In the preface to the Vagragadika, Max Muller made a critical observation regarding certain peculiarities of quote, style adopted in this treatise by the Buddhist philosophers who wished to convince their hearers of the truth of their philosophy. Unquote. From the Sanskrit text, perhaps it is difficult to realize fully what Asvagocha described as the quote, persuasiveness of Buddha's eloquence. Unquote. Yet we may quite appreciate the academic instinct of Kumarajiva, whose work on the Diamond Sutra bears evidence of a laudable endeavor to produce a classic which in the Chinese language is almost entirely beyond reproach. In all our aspirations to translate or to interpret Buddhist texts, perhaps it might prove advantageous to bear in mind the significant words incorporated in The Light of Asia, and time hath blurred their script and ancient sense, which once was new and mighty, moving all. Max Muller stated that the Diamond Sutra represents a treatise on metaphysical agnosticism, and he excused its, quote, endless repetition of the same process of reasoning, unquote, on the assumption that the subject matter of the sutra was probably, quote, perfectly familiar to children and ignorant persons." Unquote. By referring to our Chinese text, we are led to suppose that the Diamond Sutra was quote, "...delivered expressly for those who had entered the path which leads to nirvana," unquote, and for those who are quote, "...attaining to the ultimate plane of Buddhic thought." Unquote. Our Chinese annotators also appear to be unanimous in suggesting that the spiritual wisdom of the Diamond Sutra 
is understood only in its rudimentary forms by those of immature or uninitiated mind. Concerning what has been termed the agnosticism of the Diamond Sutra, Sakyamuni Buddha, when he admissibly delivered the text, indicated clearly that there is a sense in which the highest perfect knowledge may be referred to as unknown. Dante appears to have had a similar difficulty regarding knowledge and power wherewith to express the higher forms of spiritual experience, and the following lines, constituting the opening stanzas of the Paradiso, may serve to elucidate the Buddhist position, and make it perhaps more intelligible to those who are as yet unfamiliar with its peculiar modes of thought. La gloria di colui che tutto move per l'universo penetra e risplende in una parte più e meno altrove. Nel ciel che più della sua luce prende fu io e vidi cose che ridire né sa ne può qual di lassù discende perché appressandosi al suo desire nostro intelletto si profonda tanto che retro la memoria non può ire. In order to appreciate fully the philosophy of the Diamond Sutra, doubtless it is necessary to interpret aright the meaning of the Buddhist terminology. In this connection, the Sanskrit Dharma, usually rendered into Chinese by Fa and into English by Law, appears to merit our immediate attention. Max Muller, with his ample knowledge, stated that dharma, quote, in the ordinary Buddhist phraseology, may be correctly rendered by law, and thus the whole teaching of Buddha is named sadharma, the good law. What the Diamond Sutra wishes to teach is that all objects, differing one from the other by their dharmas, are elusive, or, as we should say, phenomenal and subjective, that they are, in fact, of our own making, the products of our own mind." Unquote. With those noteworthy observations, there is embodied in the preface to the Vagrakadika the following interesting suggestion, that the Greek eidos, whatever is seen, form, shape, figure, appears to be the equivalent of the Sanskrit dharma. Spence Hardy, a distinguished writer on Buddhism, made a suggestion of perhaps equal importance with reference to the correct interpretation of Dharma. In his well-known volume, Eastern Monarchism, there occurs the following relevant passage. Quote, the second of the three great treasures is called Dhammo, or in Singhalese, Dharma. This word has various meanings, but is here to be understood in the sense of truth. Rice Davids, in his useful volume Buddhism, indicated that, quote, Dharma, Pali Dhamma, is not law, but that which underlies and includes the law, a word often most difficult to translate, but best rendered here by truth and righteousness, unquote. Perhaps it may be opportune to remark that, had Kumarajiva regarded form, truth, or righteousness as expressing adequately the Sanskrit dharma, these familiar terms being obviously at his command, might have been utilized at pleasure. Like the cultured Asvagocha, Kumarajiva may have regarded the nature of the law as co-extensive with the illimitable ocean of being, and within that ample compass, perhaps he thought there might synthetically be included those beautifully defined concepts form, truth, and righteousness. Chinese annotators of the Diamond Sutra seldom criticize adversely its classic terminology or suggest many inapplicable alternative renderings. They appear to have surveyed the realm of spiritual wisdom enunciated by Sakyamuni Buddha and thereafter to have become greatly impressed by the thought that, in its essence, it might possibly be inexhaustible. This may, in part, explain their motive for incorporating in the commentary a familiar passage from Lao Tzu. Infinite truth is inexpressible. 
which in a measure illustrates the appreciable difficulty of stating, in exact terms of philosophy, the equivalent of the Buddhic law. In our intercourse with Buddhist monks, we heard the rather engaging suggestion that the familiar Christian phrase, the law of the spirit of life, contains a spiritual concept which appears to approximate closely to the idea of the law of Buddha. Those monks seem to believe that the law enters quietly and operates imperceptibly within every natural and spiritual sphere, and that they have at least a semblance of reason for their belief, the following exquisite lines clearly indicate. This is its touch upon the blossomed rose, the fashion of its hand, shaped lotus leaves. That is its painting on the glorious clouds, and these its emeralds on the peacock's train. Out of the dark it wrought the heart of man, out of dull shells the pheasant's penciled neck. It spreadeth forth for flight the eagle's wings, what time she beareth home her prey. This is its work upon the things ye see, the unseen things are more, men's hearts and minds, the thoughts of peoples and their ways and wills, those too the great law binds. As we consider the manifold operations of this law which moves to righteousness, perhaps we may gradually appreciate the dignified mind of Sakyamuni when he addressed Subhuti, saying, quote, What is usually referred to as the law of Buddha is not in reality a law attributive to Buddha. It is merely termed the law of Buddha. Unquote. The Sanskrit term samgna, usually rendered into Chinese by ming and into English by name, seems to deserve our further attention. Like the term dharma, a clear knowledge of sangma is indispensable for a correct understanding of our text. In one of the opening passages of the Diamond Sutra, we find that Sakyamuni Buddha, in reply to an inquiry by Sabuti, suggests that by means of this wisdom enlightened disciples shall be enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire. Quote, every species of life, whether hatched in the egg, formed in the womb, evolved from spawn, produced by metamorphosis, with or without form or intelligence, possessing or devoid of natural instinct, from these changeable conditions of being, I command you to seek deliverance in the transcendental concept of nirvana. Thus you shall obtain deliverance from the idea of an immeasurable, innumerable, and illimitable world of sentient life. But in reality there is no idea of a world of sentient life from which to obtain deliverance. And why? because in the mind of an enlightened disciple there have ceased to exist such arbitrary ideas of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. Unquote. A similar process of reasoning appears to permeate the whole of the Diamond Sutra, and whether appertaining to a living being, a virtue, a condition of mind, a Buddhist kingdom, or a personal Buddha, there is implied in each concept a spiritual essence, only imperfectly described, if not entirely overlooked, in the ordinary use of each particular name. Shakespeare inquired, What's in a name? And in a thought inspired by the rose and its delicious fragrance, suggested with Buddha that there is little or nothing in a name which explains the real nature of an object. Even a particle of dust seems to the Buddhist mind to embody in its composition a subtle spiritual element entirely inscrutable and quite incomprehensible. According to the Mahayana school of Buddhist thought, 
objects and their respective names are alike unreal and illusory objects and names in the abstract represent merely the products of untutored and unenlightened minds nothing is real in the sense that it is permanent everything appears to be subject to irrevocable laws of change and decay as the things which we see are temporal it is essential for our intellectual development that we focus our thoughts upon the things which are unseen and eternal many minds are susceptible of deception by the fleeting phenomena of life but behind these phenomena there is an essential element entirely spiritual uninfluenced by arbitrary ideas or changeful conditions which pervades all things and is pure and unchanging perhaps it might prove of interest to quote the following outline of mahayana doctrine prepared by mr s Kuroda, which was approved by several influential buddhist communions in japan and published with authority at tokyo in eighteen ninety three quote, all things that are produced by causes and conditions are inevitably destined to extinction there is nothing that has any reality when conditions come things begin to appear when conditions cease these things likewise cease to exist like the foam of the water like the lightning flash and like the floating swiftly vanishing clouds they are only of momentary duration as all things have no constant nature of their own so there is no actuality in pure and impure rough and fine large and small far and near knowable and unknowable etc on this account it is sometimes said that all things are nothing the apparent phenomena around us are however produced by mental operations within us and thus distinctions are established all things are included under subject and object the subject is an entity in which mental operations are awakened whenever there are objects while the object consists of all things visible and invisible knowable and unknowable etc the subject is not something that occupies some space in the body alone nor does the object exist outside of the subject the various phenomena which appear as subjects and objects are divided into two kinds the perceptible and knowable the imperceptible and unknowable now what are the imperceptible and unknowable phenomena through the influence of habitual delusions boundless worlds innumerable varieties of things spring up in the mind this boundless universe and these subtle ideas are not perceptible and knowable only bodhisattvas believe understand and become perfectly convinced of these through the contemplation of vidyamatara all things are nothing but phenomena in mind hence they are called imperceptible and unknowable what are the perceptible and knowable phenomena not knowing that these imperceptible and unknowable phenomena are the productions of their own minds men from their habitual delusions invest them with an existence outside of mind as perceptible mental phenomena as things visible audible etc these phenomena are called perceptible and knowable though there are thus two kinds perceptible and imperceptible phenomena they occur upon the same things and are inseparably bound together even in the smallest particle their difference in appearance 
is caused only by differences both in mental phenomena and in the depth of conviction those who know only the perceptible things without knowing the imperceptible are called the unenlightened by buddha in contradistinction to the fallacious phenomena there is the true essence of mind underlying the phenomena of mind there is an unchanging principle which we call essence of mind the essence of mind is the entity without ideas and without phenomena and is always the same it pervades all things and is pure and unchanging the essence and the phenomena of mind are inseparable and as the former is all-pervading and ever-existing so the phenomena occur everywhere and continually wherever suitable conditions accompany it thus the perceptible and imperceptible phenomena are manifestations of the essence of mind that according to the number and nature of conditions develop without restraint all things in the universe therefore are mind itself by this we do not mean that all things combine into a mental unity called mind nor that all things are emanations from it but that without changing their places or appearance they are mind itself everywhere buddha saw this truth and said that the whole universe was his own hence it is clear that where the essence of mind is found and the necessary conditions accompany it the phenomena of mind never fail to appear though there is a distinction between the essence and the phenomena of mind yet they are nothing but one and the same substance that is mind so we say that there exists nothing but mind though both the world of the pure and impure and the generation of all things are very wide and deep yet they owe their existence to our mind Close quote. perhaps we might appropriately indicate that however interesting or even fascinating may be the nice distinction between mind and essence of mind in relation to phenomena so far as we are aware the distinction may be implied but is never precisely stated in the text of the diamond sutra nevertheless we may readily appreciate the subtle intellectual movement which endeavors to distinguish clearly between the phenomena of mind and an unchanging principle underlying it capable of being defined as essence of mind yet we have a notion that our japanese buddhist friends intuitively find in their beautiful concept infinitely more of a purely spiritual nature than they attempt to express by the mere metaphysical term doubtless they have frequently applied to it the incisive logic of sakyamuni buddha and found simultaneously that what is ordinarily referred to as essence of mind is not in reality essence of mind it is merely termed essence of mind the term buddha as defined in the diamond sutra seems to merit a brief consideration in fulfillment of our present purpose it seems almost unnecessary to enter into questions regarding the historical buddha or to the authenticity of sutras ascribed to his genius therefore without indicating any particular reservation we meantime accept the traditional statements that the buddha of the diamond sutra was the son of suddhodana the husband of yasodra and the father of rahula but incorporated with the text there is embodied in the familiar term buddha a lofty spiritual concept which seems to place it in a category where fresh interest is imparted to the question of its interpretation 
concluding the twenty-sixth chapter of the diamond sutra wherein the spiritual body is entirely differentiated from external phenomena sakyamuni in reply to an inquiry regarding the possibility of perceiving buddha by means of his bodily distinctions delivered the following remarkable gatha i am not to be perceived by means of any visible form nor sought after by means of any audible sound whosoever walks in the way of iniquity cannot perceive the blessedness of the lord buddha in the twenty-ninth chapter of the diamond sutra wherein is expounded the majesty of the absolute sakyamuni declared that a disciple who affirms that buddha comes or goes obviously has not understood the meaning of his instruction because as we learn from our text the idea buddha implies neither coming from anywhere nor going to anywhere this purely spiritual concept of buddha seems to have seized the imagination and inspired the writer of the yuan chu sutra to whom are ascribed the following significant lines like drifting clouds like the waning moon like ships that sail the ocean like shores that are washed away these are symbolic of endless change but the blessed buddha in his essential absolute nature is changeless and everlasting again in the seventeenth chapter of the diamond sutra it is declared that in the word buddha every law is intelligibly comprehended to western minds it might become necessary to resist a natural inclination to ascribe to those elements of thought an influence which had its inception in a nation other than the indian but lest we should appear to detract from the native glory of sakyamuni buddha perhaps it might prove opportune to remark that there is sufficient evidence in the ancient vedic hymns upanishads etc to indicate clearly the probable starting points in the evolution of his thought it seems to be to the everlasting honor of some early indian philosophers that they endeavored carefully to combine in an abstract spiritual unity all the essential elements usually comprehended under the term divinity this may in a manner explain why the devout buddhist possessing a natural mental tendency induced by persistent hindu influence is enabled to regard buddha in a purely spiritual sense as the one in whom all laws are comprehended and become perfectly intelligible in the diamond sutra it may be observed that incidental reference is made by sakyamuni buddha to the doctrines of karma and reincarnation it seems to be an old truth to which expression is given in the epistle to the galatians quote, whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting unquote to the buddhist mind karma is indissolubly associated with the law which moves to righteousness thus it is accustomed to view the traditional christian idea of justification of faith rather as a devoutly conceived theory than as a reasonably constructed truth occasionally we have heard a gentle affirmation that the western mind seems unwittingly inclined to confound the doctrine of karma with a concept which is almost suggested of fatalism if karma contains even a germ of thought which corresponds to blind fatalism the idea is perhaps quite felicitously expressed in the following sentences culled from a valued letter written by an aged chinese monk Quote, karma is a universal law which gently binds us to the rhythmic cycle of evolving life it operates so quietly and imperceptibly that we scarcely are conscious of its presence 
the absolute truth of karma greatly attracts our minds which approve naturally of its consummate justice and perfect righteousness unquote. those ideas of consummate justice and perfect righteousness seem to be faithfully portrayed in the following quotation gleaned from the light of asia what hath been bringeth what shall be and is worse better last for first and first for last the angels in the heavens of gladness reap fruits of a holy past it would therefore appear that karma may be regarded generally as comprising the constituent moral elements derived consecutively from the thoughts words and actions of an interminable life cycle perhaps it is in this connection that chinese buddhists frequently assume karma to resemble quote, a moral fiber indissolubly entwined in sentient life unquote. it may be believed to recede far into the past and to extend indefinitely into the future although realizing the significance of karma the devout buddhist mind is not usually disturbed by fearful forebodings ostensibly it has evolved to a condition of holiness wherein the dross of sin is entirely consumed in the white flames of sakyamuni's transcendent wisdom and boundless love within the realm of buddhist philosophy the doctrine of reincarnation is conspicuous by reason of its peculiarly attractive charms on first acquaintance the european mind may be somewhat startled to discover that a satisfactory explanation of the interminable evolution of life is sought for by the earnest buddhist in the theory of reincarnation in the text of the diamond sutra it may be observed that sakyamundi buddha in discoursing to subhuti referred incidentally to personal reminiscences one of which belonged to a distant period of five hundred incarnations according to the text of the light of asia the spiritual consciousness of sakyamundi buddha extended to a period even more remote as may be judged by these remarkable lines i now remember myriad rains ago what time i roamed himala's hanging woods in considering briefly the doctrine of reincarnation perhaps it might readily be conceded to our buddhist friends that there were exemplified in the founder of their faith a wonderful potency of intellect and a marvelous degree of spiritual intuition quite agreeable also may be the suggestion that this potency of intellect might become intensified and probably rendered subjective by aesthetic exercises abstract contemplation and determined effort spence hardy indicated in eastern monachism that the buddhist mind conceives of spiritual powers arising from the aforementioned potency of intellect and spiritual intuition which in other systems of religion are usually regarded as partaking of the nature of divinity if it be admitted that those potential powers are probably susceptible of affiliation with the divine spirit then the way of approach to an understanding of the buddhist theory of intuition becomes perhaps tolerably clear concrete knowledge acquired by intuition appears to assure our buddhist friends of the fact of reincarnation but they invariably refrain from a vain attempt to prove the fact by an authorized and consequently stereotyped process of reasoning the unknown hindu author of the bhagavad-gita revealed in simple phraseology the native idea of reincarnation and suggested happily an instructive theory concerning the advent of great teachers and saviors in every age to krishna are ascribed the following sayings manifold the renewals of my birth have been when righteousness declines o bharata when wickedness is strong i rise from age to age and take visible shape and 
move a man with men, succoring the good, thrusting the evil back, and settling virtue on her seat again. Rise Davids justly observed that, quote, To the pious Buddhist it is a constant source of joy and gratitude that the Buddha, not only then but in many former births, when emancipation from all the cares and troubles of life was already within his reach, should again and again, in mere love for man, have condescended to enter the world and live amidst the sorrows inseparable from finite existence." Unquote. Perhaps in a more general sense the idea of reincarnation appealed strongly to the imagination of Wordsworth when he was inspired to write these familiar yet exquisite lines. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. Regarding the doctrines of individuality and non-individuality, which characterize the text of the Diamond Sutra, wherein are found to occur frequently Chinese equivalents for the ordinary concepts of an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality, the following passage from the Bhagavad Gita, suggestive almost of complete harmony with the Buddhist doctrine, may serve to make even a cursory consideration of the subject perhaps more illuminating. The passage, rendered by Sir Edwin Arnold, is as follows. There is true knowledge, learn it thou in this, to see one changeless life in all the lives, and in the separate, one inseparable. There is imperfect knowledge, that which sees the separate existences apart, and being separated, holds them real. As nirvana is only referred to casually in the Diamond Sutra, that familiar Buddhist term hardly calls for any present detailed explanation. Within a brief compass probably no better explanation may be forthcoming than what is already given in this concise exposition gathered from the light of Asia. If any teach nirvana is to cease, say unto such they lie. If any teach nirvana is to live, say unto such they err, not knowing this, nor what light shines beyond their broken lamps, nor lifeless, timeless bliss. In concluding, it might be opportune to observe that the Verturteil, known amongst modern theologians as characterizing the teaching of Albrecht Wichel, sounds, upon intimate acquaintance, merely as a faint echo of the logic of Sakyamuni Buddha. Rischel might apply his Verturteile to the presumed interpretation of a miracle, etc. Buddha suggested by his method that what is ordinarily referred to as a miracle is not in reality a miracle, therefore it is merely defined as a miracle. So also with the various dogmas which distinguish every religious creed. By many Chinese it is regarded as an evidence of divinity that in the mind of Sakyamuni Buddha there was conceived this incisive logical method, and amongst the learned monks profound homage is rendered and much wonder expressed, because the Lord Buddha did not hesitate to apply its principles to every doctrine synonymous with his own accredited law. End of section zero zero, preface and introduction. Section one of the Diamond Sutra, translated by William Gimmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Diamond Sutra, chapters one through four. Chapter one. Thus have I heard concerning our Lord Buddha. Upon a memorable occasion, the Lord Buddha sojourned in the kingdom of Shravasti, lodging in the grove of Jetta, a park within the imperial domain which Jetta, the heir apparent, bestowed upon Sutana, 
a benevolent minister of state, renowned for his charities and benefactions. With the Lord Buddha there were assembled together twelve hundred and fifty mendicant disciples, all of whom had attained the eminent degrees of spiritual wisdom. As it approached the hour for the morning meal, Lord Buddha, honored of the worlds, attired himself in a mendicant's robe, and, bearing an alms-bowl in his hands, walked towards the great city of Shravasti, which he entered to beg for food. Within the city he proceeded from door to door, and received such donations as the good people severally bestowed. Concluding this religious exercise, the Lord Buddha returned to the grove of Jetta, and partook of the frugal meal received as alms. Thereafter he divested himself of his mendicant's robe, laid aside the venerated alms-bowl, bathed his sacred feet, and accepted the honored seat reserved for him by his disciples. CHAPTER Two. Upon that occasion the venerable Subhuti occupied a place in the midst of the assembly. Rising from his seat, with cloak arranged in such manner that his right shoulder was disclosed, Subhuti knelt upon his right knee, then, pressing together the palms of his hands, he respectfully raised them towards Lord Buddha, saying, Thou art of transcendent wisdom, honored of the worlds. With wonderful solicitude thou dost preserve in the faith, and instruct in the law, this illustrious assembly of enlightened disciples. Honored of the worlds, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, seeks to obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, what immutable law shall sustain the mind of that disciple, and bring into subjection every inordinate desire? The Lord Buddha replied to Subhuti, saying, Truly, a most excellent theme. As you affirmed, I preserve in the faith, and instruct in the law, this illustrious assembly of enlightened disciples. Attend diligently unto me, and I shall enunciate a law whereby the mind of a good disciple, whether man or woman, seeking to obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, shall be adequately sustained, and enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire. Subhuti was gratified and signified glad consent. Thereupon the Lord Buddha, with majesty of person and perfect articulation, proceeded to deliver the text of this scripture, saying, Chapters 3 and 4, By this wisdom shall enlightened disciples be enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire every species of life whether hatched in the egg formed in the womb evolved from spawn produced by metamorphosis with or without form or intelligence possessing or devoid of natural instinct from these changeful conditions of being i command you to seek deliverance in the transcendental concept of nirvana. Thus you shall be delivered from an immeasurable, innumerable, and illimitable world of sentient life. But in reality there is no world of sentient life from which to seek deliverance. And why? Because in the minds of enlightened disciples there have ceased to exist such arbitrary concepts of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. Moreover, Subhuti, an enlightened disciple ought to act spontaneously in the exercise of charity, uninfluenced by sensuous phenomena such as sound, odor, taste, touch, or law. Subhuti, it is imperative that an enlightened disciple, in the exercise of charity, should act independently of phenomena. And why? 
because acting without regard to elusive forms of phenomena he will realize in the exercise of charity a merit inestimable and immeasurable Subuti, what think you is it possible to estimate the distance comprising the illimitable universe of space Subuti replied saying honored of the worlds it is impossible to estimate the distance comprising the illimitable universe of space the lord buddha thereupon discoursed saying it is equally impossible to estimate the merit of an enlightened disciple who discharges the exercise of charity unperturbed by the seductive influences of phenomena Subuti, the mind of an enlightened disciple ought thus to be indoctrinated end of section one chapters one through four section two of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell this librivox recording is in the public domain section two chapters five through seven chapter five the lord buddha interrogated subuti saying what think you is it possible that by means of his physical body the lord buddha may be clearly perceived subuti replied saying no honored of the worlds it is impossible that by means of his physical body the lord buddha may be clearly perceived and why because what the lord buddha referred to as a physical body is in reality not merely a physical body thereupon the lord buddha addressed subuti saying every form or quality of phenomena is transient and elusive when the mind realizes that the phenomena of life are not real phenomena the lord buddha may then be clearly perceived chapter six subuti inquired of the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds in future ages when this scripture is proclaimed amongst those beings destined to hear shall any conceive within their minds a sincere unmingled faith the lord buddha replied to subuti saying have no such apprehensive thought even at the remote period of five centuries subsequent to the nirvana of the lord buddha there will be many disciples observing the monastic vows and assiduously devoted to good works these hearing this scripture proclaimed will believe in its immutability and similarly conceive within their minds a pure unmingled faith besides it is important to realize that faith thus conceived is not exclusively in virtue of the insular thought of any particular buddha but because of its affiliation with the concrete thoughts of myriad buddhas throughout infinite ages therefore amongst the beings destined to hear this scripture proclaimed many by momentary reflection will intuitively conceive a pure and holy faith subuti the lord buddha by his presence is perfectly cognizant of all such potential disciples and for these also there is reserved an immeasurable merit and why because the minds of these disciples will not revert to such arbitrary concepts of phenomena as an entity a being a living being a personality qualities or ideas coincident with law or existing apart from the idea of law and why because assuming the permanency and reality of phenomena the minds of these disciples 
would be involved in such distinctive ideas as an entity a being a living being and a personality affirming the permanency and reality of qualities or ideas coincident with law their minds would inevitably be involved in resolving these same definitions postulating the inviolate nature of qualities or ideas which have an existence apart from the law there yet remain to be explained these abstruse distinctions an entity a being a living being and a personality therefore enlightened disciples ought not to affirm the permanency or reality of qualities or ideas coincident with law nor postulate as being of an inviolate nature qualities or ideas having an existence apart from the concept of law thus we are enabled to appreciate the significance of those words which the lord buddha invariably repeated to his followers you disciples must realize that the law which i enunciated was presented before your minds in the simile of a raft if the law having fulfilled its function in bearing you to the other shore nirvana with its coincident qualities and ideas must inevitably be abandoned how much more inevitable must be the abandonment of qualities or ideas which have an existence apart from the law chapter seven the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you has the lord buddha really attained to supreme spiritual wisdom or has he a system of doctrine which can be specifically formulated subhuti replied saying as i understand the meaning of the lord buddha's discourse he has no system of doctrine which can be specifically formulated nor can the lord buddha express in explicit terms a form of knowledge which can be described as supreme spiritual wisdom and why because what the lord buddha adumbrated in terms of the law is transcendental and inexpressible being a purely spiritual concept it is neither consonant with law nor synonymous with anything apart from the law thus is exemplified the manner by which wise disciples and holy buddhas regarding intuition as the law of their minds severally attained to different planes of spiritual wisdom end of section two chapters five through seven Section three of the Diamond Sutra translated by William Gemmell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters eight through ten. Chapter eight. The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, What think you? If a benevolent person bestowed as alms an abundance of the seven treasures sufficient to fill the universe, would there accrue to that person a considerable merit subhuti replied saying a very considerable merit honored of the worlds and why because what is referred to does not partake of the nature of ordinary merit and in this sense the lord buddha made mention of a considerable merit the lord buddha rejoined saying if a disciple adhered with implicit faith to a stanza of this scripture and diligently explained it to others the intrinsic merit of that disciple would be relatively greater and why because subhuti the holy buddhas and the law by which they attained to supreme spiritual wisdom 
severally owe their inception to the truth of this sacred scripture. Subuti, what is ordinarily termed the Buddhic law, is not really a law attributive to Buddha. Chapter 9 The Lord Buddha inquired of Subuti, saying, What think you? May a Skrotapati, having entered the stream which bears on to Nirvana, thus moralize within himself, I have obtained the fruits commensurate with the merit of a Skrotapati? Subuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, and why? Because Skrotapati is simply a descriptive term signifying having entered the stream a disciple who avoids the seductive phenomena of form sound odor taste touch and law is named a scrotapati the lord buddha again inquired of subuti saying what think you may a sacradagami who is subject only to one more reincarnation thus muse within himself I have obtained the fruits consonant with the merits of a sacradagami. Subuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, and why? Because sacradagami is merely a descriptive title denoting only one more reincarnation, but in reality there is no such condition as only one more reincarnation. Hence, Sakridagami is merely a descriptive title. The Lord Buddha once again inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? May an Anagami, having entire immunity from reincarnation, thus reflect within himself, I have obtained the fruits which accord with the merit of an Anagami? Subhuti replied, saying, no, honored of the worlds, and why? Because anagami is merely a designation meaning immunity from reincarnation, but in reality there is no such condition as immunity from reincarnation. Hence anagami is merely a convenient designation. The Lord Buddha yet again inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? May an Arhat, having attained to absolute quiescence of mind, thus meditate within himself, I have obtained the condition of an Arhat. Subhuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, and why? Because there is not in reality a condition synonymous with the term Arhat. Honored of the worlds, if an arhat thus meditates within himself, I have obtained the condition of an arhat, there would be obvious recurrence of such arbitrary concepts as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. Honored of the worlds, when the Lord Buddha declared that, in absolute quiescence of mind, perfect observance of the law, and true spiritual perception, I was pre-eminent amongst the disciples. I did not cogitate thus within myself. I am an arhat, freed from desire. Had I thus cogitated, I have obtained the condition of an arhat. The honored of the worlds would not have declared concerning me. Subhuti delights in the austerities practiced by the aranyaka. But in reality, Subhuti was perfectly quiescent and oblivious to phenomena. Hence the illusion, Subhuti delights in the austerities practiced by the Aranyaka. Chapter 10 The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, What think you? When the Lord Buddha, in a previous life, was a disciple of Dipankara Buddha, was there communicated to him any prescribed law or system of doctrine whereby he eventually became a Buddha? Subhuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, 
when the lord buddha was a disciple of dipankara buddha neither prescribed law nor system of doctrine was communicated to him whereby he eventually became a buddha the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you may an enlightened disciple thus ponder within himself i shall create numerous buddhist kingdoms subhuti replied saying no honored of the worlds and why because kingdoms thus created would not in reality be buddhist kingdoms therefore the creation of numerous buddhist kingdoms is merely a figure of speech the lord buddha continuing addressed subhuti saying enlightened disciples ought therefore to engender within themselves a pure and holy mind they ought not to depend on the phenomena of form sound odor taste touch or law they ought to sedulously cultivate a mind independent of every material aid the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying supposing a man with a body as pretentious as sumeru prince among mountains would you esteem such a body as being great subhuti replied saying exceedingly great honored of the worlds and why because the lord buddha referred not to a physical body but to mental and spiritual concepts of bodies in which sense a body may be regarded as really great end of section three chapters eight through ten section four of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapters eleven through thirteen chapter eleven the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying if there were rivers ganges as numerous as the sands of the ganges would the aggregate grains of sand be of considerable number subhuti replied saying of very considerable number honored of the worlds the rivers ganges alone would be innumerable and much more innumerable would be the grains of sand the lord buddha thereupon addressed subhuti saying i have a truth to declare unto you if a good disciple whether man or woman were to bestow in the exercise of charity an abundance of the seven treasures sufficient to fill as many boundless universes as there would be grains of sand in these innumerable rivers would the cumulative merit of such a disciple be considerable subhuti replied saying very considerable honored of the worlds the lord buddha then declared unto subhuti if a good disciple whether man or woman were with implicit faith to adhere to a stanza of this scripture and diligently explain it to others the consequent merit would be relatively greater than the other chapter twelve the lord buddha continuing said unto subhuti wherever this scripture is proclaimed even though it were but a stanza comprising four lines you should realize that that place would be sanctified by the presence of the whole realm of gods men and terrestrial spirits who ought unitedly to worship as if before a sacred shrine of buddha but what encomium shall express the merit of a disciple who rigorously observes and diligently studies the text of this scripture subhuti you realize that such a disciple will be endowed with spiritual powers commensurate with initiation in the supreme incomparable and most wonderful law 
whatever place constitutes a repository for this sacred scripture there also the lord buddha may be found together with disciples worthy of reverence and honor chapter thirteen upon that occasion subhuti inquired of the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds by what name shall this scripture be known that we may regard it with reverence the lord buddha replied saying subhuti this scripture shall be known as the diamond sutra the transcendent wisdom by means of which we reach the other shore by this name you shall reverently regard it and why subhuti what the lord buddha declared as transcendent wisdom by means of which we reach the other shore is not essentially transcendent wisdom in its essence it transcends all wisdom the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you did the lord buddha formulate a precise system of law or doctrine subhuti replied saying honored of the worlds the lord buddha did not formulate a precise system of law or doctrine the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you within the myriad worlds which comprise this universe are the atoms of dust numerous subhuti replied saying very numerous honored of the worlds the lord buddha continuing his discourse said subhuti the lord buddha declares that all these atoms of dust are not essentially atoms of dust they are merely termed atoms of dust the lord buddha also declares that those myriad worlds are not really myriad worlds they are merely designated myriad worlds the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you can the lord buddha be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions subhuti replied saying no honored of the worlds the lord buddha cannot be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions and why because what the lord buddha referred to as his thirty-two bodily distinctions are not in reality bodily distinctions they are merely defined as bodily distinctions the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying if a good disciple whether man or woman day by day sacrificed lives innumerable as the sands of the ganges and if another disciple adhered with implicit faith to a stanza of this scripture and diligently explained it to others the intrinsic merit of such a disciple would be relatively greater than the other end of section four chapters eleven through thirteen Section 5 of The Diamond Sutra, translated by William Gemmell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5, Chapters 14 through 16. Chapter 14. Upon that occasion, the Venerable Subhuti, hearing the text of this scripture proclaimed, and profoundly realizing its meaning, was moved to tears. Addressing the Lord Buddha, he said, thou art of transcendent wisdom honored of the worlds the lord buddha in expounding this supreme canon of scripture surpassed in perspicuity every exposition previously heard by me since my eyes were privileged to perceive this most excellent wisdom honored of the worlds in years to come if disciples hearing this scripture proclaimed and having within their minds a pure and holy faith engender true concepts of the ephemeral nature of phenomena we ought to realize that the cumulative merit of such disciples will be intrinsic and wonderful honored of the worlds the true concept of phenomena is 
that these are not essentially phenomena and hence the lord buddha declared that they are merely termed phenomena honored of the worlds having heard this unprecedented scripture faith clear understanding and firm resolve to observe its precepts follow as a natural sequence if in future ages disciples destined to hear this scripture likewise believe understand and observe its precepts their merit will incite the highest wonder and praise and why because the minds of those disciples will have outgrown such arbitrary ideas of phenomena as an entity a being a living being or a personality and why because the entity is in reality non-entity and a being a living being or a personality are ideas equally nebulous and hypothetical wherefore discarding every arbitrary idea of phenomena the wise and wholly enlightened were severally designated buddha the lord buddha assenting said unto subhuti if in future ages disciples destined to hear this scripture neither become perturbed by its extreme modes of thought nor alarmed by its lofty sentiments nor apprehensive about realizing its high ideals these disciples also by their intrinsic merit will incite superlative wonder and praise Subhuti, what the lord buddha referred to as the first paramita charity is not in reality the first paramita it is merely termed the first paramita Subhuti, regarding the third paramita endurance it is not in reality a paramita it is merely termed a paramita and why because in a previous life when the prince of kalinga kaliraja severed the flesh from my limbs and body at that time i was oblivious to such arbitrary ideas of phenomena as an entity a being a living being or a personality and why because upon that occasion when my limbs and body were rent asunder had i not been oblivious to such arbitrary ideas as an entity a being a living being or a personality there would have originated within my mind feelings of anger and resentment Subhuti, five hundred incarnations ago i recollect that as a recluse practicing the ordinances of the kshanti paramita even then i had no such arbitrary ideas as an entity a being a living being or a personality therefore Subhuti, an enlightened disciple ought to discard as being unreal and elusive every conceivable form of phenomena in aspiring to supreme spiritual wisdom the mind ought to be insensible to every sensuous influence and independent of everything pertaining to sound odor taste touch or law there ought to be cultivated a condition of complete independence of mind because if the mind is depending upon any external aid it is obviously deluded there is in reality nothing external to depend upon therefore the lord buddha declared that in the exercise of charity the mind of an enlightened disciple ought not to depend upon any form of phenomena Subhuti, an enlightened disciple desirous to confer benefits upon the whole realm of being ought thus to be animated in the exercise of charity the lord buddha in declaring the unreality of phenomena also affirmed 
that the whole realm of sentient life is ephemeral and illusory. Sabuti, the sayings of the Lord Buddha are true, credible, and immutable. His utterances are neither extravagant nor chimerical. Sabuti, the plane of thought to which the Lord Buddha attained cannot be explained in terms synonymous with reality or non-reality. Sabuti, in the exercise of charity, if the mind of an enlightened disciple is not independent of every law, he is like unto a person having entered impenetrable darkness, and to whom every object is invisible. But an enlightened disciple, discharging the exercise of charity with a mind independent of every law, is like unto a person having the power of vision in the meridian glory of the sunlight, and to whom every object is visible. Sabuti, in future ages, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, rigorously studies and observes the text of this scripture, the Lord Buddha, by means of his Buddhic wisdom, entirely knows and perceives that for such a disciple there is reserved a cumulative merit immeasurable and illimitable. Chapter 15 The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, in the morning, at noonday, and at eventide, sacrificed lives innumerable as the sands of the Ganges, and thus without intermission throughout infinite ages, and if another disciple, hearing this scripture proclaimed, steadfastly believed it, his felicity would be appreciably greater than the other. But how much greater must be the felicity of a disciple who transcribes the sacred text, observes its precepts, studies its laws, and repeats the scripture that others may be edified thereby. Subhuti, the relative importance of this scripture may thus be summarily stated. Its truth is infinite, its worth incomparable, and its merit interminable. The Lord Buddha delivered this scripture specifically for those who are entered upon the path which leads to nirvana, and for those who are attaining to the ultimate plane of buddhic thought. If a disciple rigorously observes, studies, and widely disseminates the knowledge of this scripture, the Lord Buddha entirely knows and perceives that for such an one there will be a cumulative merit, immeasurable, incomparable, illimitable, and inconceivable. All such disciples will be endowed with transcendent buddhic wisdom and enlightenment. And why? Because, Subhuti, if a disciple takes pleasure in a narrow or exclusive form of the law, he cannot receive with gratification the instruction of this scripture or delight in its study, or fervently explain it to others. Subhuti, in whatever place there is a repository for this scripture, the whole realm of spiritual beings ought to adore it, scattering profusely sweet-scented flowers and pure odors of fragrant incense. Chapter 16 the Lord Buddha, continuing, addressed Subhuti, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, devoted to the observance and study of this scripture, is thereby despised or lightly esteemed, it is because that, 
in a previous life there had been committed some grievous transgression followed now by inexorable retribution but although in this life despised or lightly esteemed the compensating merit thus acquired will cause the transgression of a former life to be fully expiated and the disciple adequately recompensed by the attainment of supreme spiritual wisdom furthermore subuti numberless ages ago i recollect that before the advent of dipankara buddha there were myriad buddhas before whom i served and received religious instruction my conduct being entirely blameless and without reproach but in the ages to come if a disciple be enabled to rigorously observe and to study the text of this scripture the merit thus acquired will so far exceed the measure of my merit in the service of those myriad buddhas that it cannot be stated in terms of proportion nor comprehended by means of any analogy again sabuti in future ages if a good disciple whether man or woman be enabled to rigorously observe and to study consecutively the texts of this scripture were i to elaborate either the nature or extent of this merit those who heard it might become delirious or entirely doubt its credibility Subuti, it is necessary to realize that as the meaning of this scripture is beyond ordinary comprehension the scope of its fruitful rewards is equally incomprehensible end of section five chapters fourteen through sixteen section six of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell this librivox recording is in the public domain section six chapters seventeen through nineteen chapter seventeen upon that occasion the venerable subuti addressed the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds if a good disciple whether man or woman having desired to attain to supreme spiritual wisdom what immutable law shall support the mind of that disciple and bring into subjection every inordinate desire the lord buddha replied saying a good disciple whether man or woman ought thus to habituate his mind i must become oblivious to every idea of sentient life and having become oblivious to every idea of sentient life there is no one to whom the idea of sentient life has become oblivious and why because subuti if an enlightened disciple retains within his mind such arbitrary ideas of sentient life as an entity a being a living being or a personality he has not attained to supreme spiritual wisdom and why because subuti there is no law by means of which a disciple may be defined as one having obtained supreme spiritual wisdom the lord buddha addressed subuti saying what think you when the lord buddha was a disciple of nipankara buddha was there bequeathed to him any law whereby he attained to supreme spiritual wisdom subuti replied saying no honored of the worlds inasmuch as i am able to comprehend the meaning of the lord buddha's discourse when the lord buddha was a disciple of dinpankara buddha there was no law bequeathed to him whereby he attained to supreme spiritual wisdom the lord buddha endorsed these words saying truly there is no law by means of which the lord buddha obtained supreme spiritual wisdom 
Sabuti, if there existed a law by means of which the Lord Buddha obtained supreme spiritual wisdom, Dipankara Buddha would not have foretold at my initiation, In future ages thou shalt become Sakyamuni Buddha. But in reality there is no law by means of which supreme spiritual wisdom can be obtained. Therefore, at my initiation, Dipankara Buddha foretold concerning me, In future ages thou shalt become Sakyamuni Buddha. And why? Because in the word Buddha every law is summarily and intelligibly comprehended. If a disciple affirmed that the Lord Buddha attained to supreme spiritual wisdom, it is necessary to state that there is no law whereby this condition of mind can be realized. The supreme spiritual wisdom to which the Lord Buddha attained cannot, in its essence, be defined as real or unreal. Thus the Lord Buddha declared that the ordinarily accepted term, the Buddhic law, is synonymous with every moral and spiritual law. Subhuti, what are ordinarily declared to be systems of law are not in reality systems of law. They are merely termed systems of law. The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, Can you imagine a man having a great physical body? Subhuti replied, saying, The Lord Buddha, discoursing upon the proportions of a physical body, did not maintain for these any real greatness, therefore it is merely termed a great body. The Lord Buddha thereupon addressed Subhuti, saying, Thus it is with an enlightened disciple. If he were to expatiate after this manner, I must become oblivious to every idea of sentient life. He cannot be described as fully enlightened. And why? Because there is no law whereby a disciple can be approved as fully enlightened. Therefore, the Lord Buddha declared that within the realm of spiritual law there is neither an entity, a being, a living being, nor a personality. The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, If an enlightened disciple were to speak in this wise, I shall create numerous Buddhist kingdoms, he could not be designated fully enlightened. And why? Because the Lord Buddha, discoursing upon creating numerous Buddhist kingdoms, did not affirm the idea of creating numerous material Buddhist kingdoms, hence the creation of numerous Buddhist kingdoms is merely a figure of speech. Subhuti, the Lord Buddha declared that a disciple may be regarded as truly enlightened, whose mind is thoroughly imbued with the law of non-individuality. Chapter 18 The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the physical eye? Subhuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the physical eye. The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the divine or spiritual eye? Subhuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the divine or spiritual eye. The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the eye of wisdom? Subhuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the eye of wisdom. 
the lord buddha inquired of subhuti saying what think you does the lord buddha possess the eye of truth subhuti assented saying honored of the worlds the lord buddha truly possesses the eye of truth the lord buddha inquired of subhuti saying what think you does the lord buddha possess the buddhic eye subhuti assented saying honored of the worlds the lord buddha truly possesses the buddhic eye the lord buddha inquired of subhuti saying what think you concerning the sands of the ganges did the lord buddha declare that these were grains of sand subhuti assenting said honored of the worlds the lord buddha declared that these were grains of sand the lord buddha inquired of subhuti saying what think you if there were as many rivers ganges as there are grains of sand in the ganges and if there were as many buddhist worlds as the grains of sand in those innumerable rivers would these buddhist worlds be numerous subhuti replied saying honored of the worlds these buddhist worlds would be very numerous the lord buddha continuing addressed subhuti saying within these innumerable worlds every form of sentient life with their various mental dispositions are entirely known to the lord buddha and why because what the lord buddha referred to as their various mental dispositions are not in reality their various mental dispositions these are merely termed their various mental dispositions and why because subhuti dispositions of mind or modes of thought whether relating to the past the present or the future are alike unreal and illusory chapter nineteen the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you if a disciple having obtained all the treasures of this universe were to bestow these in the exercise of charity would such a disciple consequently enjoy a considerable merit subhuti assenting said honored of the worlds such a disciple would consequently enjoy a very considerable merit the lord buddha thereupon addressed subhuti saying if there were any real or permanent quality in merit the lord buddha would not have spoken of such merit as considerable it is because there is neither a tangible nor material quality in merit that the lord buddha referred to the merit of that disciple as considerable end of section six chapters seventeen through nineteen section seven of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell this librivox recording is in the public domain the diamond sutra section seven chapters twenty through twenty two chapter twenty the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you can the lord buddha be perceived by means of his perfect material body subhuti replied saying honored of the worlds it is improbable that the lord buddha can be perceived by means of his perfect material body and why because what the lord buddha referred to as a perfect material body is not in reality a perfect material body it is merely termed a perfect material body the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you can the lord buddha be perceived by means of any physical phenomena subhuti replied saying honored of the worlds it is improbable that the lord buddha can be perceived by means of any physical phenomena and why 
because what the lord buddha referred to as physical phenomena are not in reality physical phenomena these are merely termed physical phenomena chapter twenty one the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying do not affirm that the lord buddha thinks thus within himself i ought to promulgate a system of law or doctrine have no such irrelevant thought and why because if a disciple affirmed that the lord buddha promulgated a system of law or doctrine he would defame the lord buddha being manifestly unable to understand the purport of my instruction subhuti regarding the promulgation of a system of law or doctrine there is in reality no system of law or doctrine to promulgate it is merely termed a system of law or doctrine upon that occasion the virtuous and venerable subhuti inquired of the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds in ages to come will sentient beings destined to hear this law engender within their minds the essential elements of faith the lord buddha replied saying subhuti it cannot be asserted that these are sentient beings or that these are not sentient beings and why because subhuti regarding sentient beings the lord buddha declared that in reality these are not sentient beings they are merely termed sentient beings chapter twenty two subhuti inquired of the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds did the lord buddha in attaining to supreme spiritual wisdom obtain nothing of a real or tangible nature the lord buddha replied saying in attaining to supreme spiritual wisdom not a vestige of law or doctrine was obtained and therefore it is termed supreme spiritual wisdom end of section seven chapters twenty through twenty two section eight of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell this librivox recording is in the public domain section eight chapters twenty three through twenty five chapter twenty three the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying this law is coherent and indivisible it is neither above nor below therefore it is termed supreme spiritual wisdom it excludes such arbitrary ideas as an entity a being a living being or a personality but includes every law pertaining to the cultivation of goodness subhuti what were referred to as laws pertaining to goodness these the lord buddha declared are not in reality laws pertaining to goodness they are merely termed laws pertaining to goodness chapter twenty four the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying if within this universe of universes the seven treasures were heaped together forming as many great elevations as there are sumerus prince of mountains and these treasures bestowed entirely in the exercise of charity and if a disciple were to select a stanza of this scripture rigorously observe it and diligently explain it to others the merit thus obtained would so far exceed the former excellence that it cannot be stated in terms of proportion nor comprehended by any analogy chapter twenty five the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying what think you you disciples do not affirm that the lord buddha reflects thus within himself 
I bring salvation to every living being. Subuti, entertain no such delusive thought. And why? Because in reality there are no living beings to whom the Lord Buddha can bring salvation. If there were living beings to whom the Lord Buddha could bring salvation, the Lord Buddha would necessarily assume the reality of such arbitrary concepts as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. Subhuti, what the Lord Buddha adverted to as an entity is not in reality an entity. It is only understood to be an entity and believed in as such by the common uneducated people. Subhuti, what are ordinarily referred to as the common uneducated people, these the Lord Buddha declared to be not merely common uneducated people. End of section 8, chapters 23 through 25. Section 9 of The Diamond Sutra, translated by William Gemmell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9, chapters 26 through 28. Chapter 26. The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, Can the Lord Buddha be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions? Subhuti replied, saying, Even so, the Lord Buddha can be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions. The Lord Buddha, continuing, said unto Subhuti, If by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions it were possible to perceive the Lord Buddha, then the Lord Buddha would merely resemble one of the great wheel-turning kings. Subhuti thereupon addressed the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, according as I am able to interpret the Lord Buddha's instruction, it is improbable that the Lord Buddha may be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions. Thereafter the honored of the worlds delivered this sublime gatha. I am not to be perceived by means of any visible form, nor sought after by means of any audible sound. Whosoever walks in the way of iniquity cannot perceive the blessedness of the Lord Buddha. Chapter 27 The Lord Buddha said unto Subhuti, If you think thus within yourself, the Lord Buddha did not by means of his perfect bodily distinctions obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, Subhuti, have no such deceptive thought. Or, if you think thus within yourself, in obtaining supreme spiritual wisdom, the Lord Buddha declared the abrogation of every law, Subhuti, have no such delusive thought. And why? Because those disciples who obtain supreme spiritual wisdom neither affirm the abrogation of any law nor the destruction of any distinctive quality of phenomena. Chapter 28 The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, If an enlightened disciple, in the exercise of charity, bestowed as considerable an amount of the seven treasures as might fill worlds numerous as the sands of the Ganges, and if a disciple, realizing that within the meaning and purport of the law there is no abstract individual existence, perfects himself in the virtue of endurance, this latter disciple will have a cumulative merit relatively greater than the other. And why? 
because enlightened disciples are entirely unaffected by considerations of reward or merit sabuti thereupon inquired of the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds in what respect are enlightened disciples unaffected by considerations of reward or merit the lord buddha replied saying enlightened disciples do not aspire in a spirit of covetousness to rewards commensurate with their merit therefore i declare that they are entirely unaffected by considerations of reward or merit end of section nine chapters twenty six through twenty eight section ten of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell this librivox recording is in the public domain section ten chapters twenty nine through thirty two chapter twenty nine the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying if a disciple asserts that the lord buddha comes or goes sits or reclines obviously he has not understood the meaning of my discourse and why because the idea buddha implies neither coming from anywhere nor going to anywhere and hence the synonym buddha chapter thirty the lord buddha addressed sabuti saying if a good disciple whether man or woman were to take infinite worlds and reduce them to minute particles of dust what think you would the aggregate of all those particles of dust be great subuti replied saying honored of the worlds the aggregate of all those particles of dust would be exceedingly great and why because if all those were in reality minute particles of dust the lord buddha would not have declared them to be minute particles of dust and why because the lord buddha discoursing upon minute particles of dust declared that in reality those are not minute particles of dust they are merely termed minute particles of dust sabuti continuing addressed the lord buddha saying honored of the worlds what the lord buddha discoursed upon as infinite worlds these are not in reality infinite worlds they are merely termed infinite worlds and why because if these were in reality infinite worlds there would of necessity be unity and eternity of matter but the lord buddha discoursing upon the unity and eternity of matter declared that there is neither unity nor eternity of matter therefore it is merely termed unity and eternity of matter the lord buddha thereupon declared unto subuti belief in the unity or eternity of matter is incomprehensible and only common worldly-minded people for purely materialistic reasons covet this hypothesis chapter thirty one the lord buddha addressed subuti saying if a disciple affirmed that the lord buddha enunciated a belief that the mind can comprehend the idea of an entity a being a living being or a personality what think you subuti would that disciple be interpreting aright the meaning of my discourse subuti replied saying honored of the worlds that disciple would not be interpreting aright the meaning of the lord buddha's discourse and why because honored of the worlds discoursing upon comprehending such ideas as 
an entity a being a living being and a personality it was declared that these are entirely unreal and elusive and therefore they are merely termed an entity a being a living being and a personality the lord buddha thereafter addressed subhuti saying those who aspire to the attainment of supreme spiritual wisdom ought thus to know believe in and interpret phenomena they ought to eliminate from their minds every tangible evidence of every visible object subhuti concerning visible objects the lord buddha declared that these are not really visible objects they are merely termed visible objects chapter thirty two the lord buddha addressed subhuti saying if a disciple having immeasurable spheres filled with the seven treasures bestowed these in the exercise of charity and if a disciple whether man or woman having aspired to supreme spiritual wisdom selected from this scripture a stanza comprising four lines then rigorously observed it studied it and diligently explained it to others the cumulative merit of such a disciple would be relatively greater than the other in what attitude of mind should it be diligently explained to others not assuming the permanency or the reality of earthly phenomena but in the conscious blessedness of a mind at perfect rest and why because the phenomena of life may be likened unto a dream a phantasm a bubble a shadow the glistening dew or lightning flash and thus they ought to be contemplated when the lord buddha concluded his enunciation of this scripture the venerable subhuti the monks nuns lay brethren and sisters all mortals and the whole realm of spiritual beings rejoiced exceedingly and consecrated to its practice they received it and departed as when men traveling feel a glorious perfume sweet pervading all the countryside and gladdening them infer at once surely tis giant forest trees are flowering now so conscious of this perfume sweet of righteousness that now pervades the earth and heavens they may infer a buddha infinitely great must once have lived end of section ten chapters twenty nine through thirty two and end of the diamond sutra translated by william gemmell recorded by john greenman